Well, we're still at the gathering of Victorian locomotives in Antonito, Colorado. Five different uh, locomotives from the 1870s, 80s, and 90s. But this week we're focusing on two, the same two that we were kind of focusing on last week. Well, I focus on them all the time because they're two of my favorites. Oh man, I love focusing on these. The front one here is Eureka and Palisade number four, and the back one is the Glenbrook. So our adventure begins here in Antonito, Colorado. However, that is not a Colorado flag, it is Nevada. Yeah, Battle Born. Both of those engines are from Nevada. <laughs> so before we could ride the train over the line up to Bighorn, they needed to run them around and test them. Uh, the Glenbrook's never been out on a railroad before. I know, isn't that weird? Well, I won't say weird, but it's interesting. It's interesting. Now speaking of interesting, as we all know, steam locomotives run mostly on water. Right. There's fuel, but the boy, they use a lot of water. They actually need a water car like the big boy. Yeah, and I think they don't want to do that just because they'd like it to look as original as possible. <laughs> It looks like they've sprung a leak. A whole bunch of them. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I don't want to pay their water bill. No. But um, at least this tank has water in it. Uh, there's one tank out on the line that doesn't have water. For the most part, the old original water tanks, and in this case the water column at Sublette, are working just fine. And with these big locomotives that they normally run, they can skip water water stops and only stop every second water stop. But the antique locomotives, well, they just can't get past a water stop. No. <laughs> they, and this is the lava tank, and uh, you can sort of tell by its condition that it hasn't worked in a long, long time. But it's still there, and that's cool. And it's, yeah, and they've been trying to restore it, but in the meantime, it doesn't work. No. And so they had to figure out a workaround for the antique locomotives, and this is the workaround. They've hauled a, a water car and, as it happens, a gondola full of wood. Oh, there you go. And they've spotted it up here at Lava, and then that way they can pump water into the locomotives uh, until they can figure out how to get the tank running. And then they have to station a guy up here, hi, <laughs> uh, I guess just to, to help with loading. Anyway, the water car has to be loaded and sent up there before we can go out on the line. Right. So they, they bring the water car all the way down here to Alamosa. Alamosa and Anito. And Anito, one of those A places. <laughs> the A places. And they fill it from the leaky tank. They should change the name of this tank to leaky tank. Gosh, they just put another bu bucket underneath there because I think there's more going on the ground than in the tank. Yeah, if you needed a shower, <laughs> just stand right there. It'd be a funny joke to get somebody to stand there while they lower the thing. 
Anyway, then they'll be, <laughs> they'll be hauling the water car up to lava and spotting it there on the balloon track and then dropping off a, a crew guy to, uh, to help with loading wood when they get up there. So again, they're going to be driving the two locomotives around the balloon track here, the balloon track, say that quickly, uh, here at Andonito a few times. Again, just to test the setup. Right. Because uh, uh, the Glenbrook has brand new air brakes on it. These engines have never been coupled together and double-headed before. There's just a lot of things to test before they head out on the railroad. Well, I was testing my camera. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> it, talk about a visual. No kidding. This is just so beautiful. So as we mentioned before, these locomotives came in from Nevada. Right. Uh, the front one here, Eureka, Eureka and Palisade Number no. 4, belongs to Dan Markoff, who restored it in his backyard. That is so awesome. That's <laughs> so neat. And he takes it around from time to time to different events. The rear locomotive is the Glenbrook, and that's from the Nevada State Railroad Museum in Carson City, Nevada. And again, uh, we mentioned that this locomotive just went through a restoration a few years ago and has just been running at the museum. This is its first actual excursion on a railroad and it's been fitted with air brakes because nothing's allowed out onto the railroad unless it's fitted with air brakes. So there's been some rebuilding of the Glenbrook. And these are the cars that we're going to be riding in. Uh, these were restored by the Friends of the Cumbers and Toltec. Right. And uh, while the Cumbers and Toltec is a for-profit scenic railroad, there's also the non-profit historical arm, the Friends of the Cumbers and Toltec, and they're taking all of the old original equipment and restoring it. 
And these three passenger cars have been a project that they've been working on for years. They just barely finished this one. That's one of my favorites. That's one, oh man, the sleeping car. I, I've never seen a, a Rio Grande narrow gauge sleeping car before, but they just finished that one up and it will be on our train. Now, of course, our train is going to be chased by a couple hundred rail fans. Oh, look at them go. <laughs> I'm glad I have a freeway to drive on. Remember that, that time in oh. Wyoming when somebody was doing this backwards? Backwards. Somebody was trying to get a shot, and they were doing 40 miles an hour backwards. Anyway, the, the east end of the Cumbers and Toltec is all dirt roads, and they get sketchier and sketchier and sketchier. So you sort of have to admire anybody that, that chases up on the east end. This is Whiplash. And it's a triple switchback. Look at that, it comes over here, it goes over there, and then it comes, that's why they call it whiplash. But they needed to do this triple switchback to get elevation up onto this volcanic ridge. Now, fortunately, we have a concession car with bathrooms in it. Oh, absolutely glad for that. The, the, the modern conveniences. But they've taken this boxcar and backdated it to the 1890s so that it looks authentic on the train. But inside, it's our nice modern concession car uh, with bathroom. So the insides of these cars are just spectacular. Oh, I love the light fixtures. Yeah, I don't I don't know if they found originals or, or rebuild. I don't know. These run on gas or originally ran on gas. This is kind of funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> these were required signs back in the day and they've put those back up. Um, anyway, the, the insides of these cars are just absolutely perfect. Uh, this is the 292 car. This is the next car back in the train, and uh, not the one we were riding in. It's quite a bit different inside. It still has gas lighting, but it's a totally different type of light than the car that we were riding in. One thing that's, that's kind of fun, they have re, uh, reconfigured these so that they run on electricity, so that they don't have to gum up here and actually light the gas fire. Oh. And I was talking to one of the friends of the Cumbers and Toltec, and he was explaining that, and so I said, please turn it on. Ah. And so he did. He, he turned they, it on. They don't like to turn them on because they run on rechargeable batteries, oh. and they, they needed this for the night train, and it's like, oh, please don't run my battery down. But uh, they were able to turn the light on. And this is the inside of the sleeping car. 
Oh, that's nice. Isn't it strange? Well, I like it. It's just neat. It's really neat. So those upper bunks fold down onto those brass brackets, and then two mattresses are stowed up in there. The seats make up into a bunk, and one of the mattresses goes down there, and the other one up on the uh, upper, and uh, everybody that's riding down below gets to have a lovely sleep. Right. Anyway, it's mostly fun just to, to ride the train and, and watch the scenery go yes. by. Yes. It's, it's spectacular out right. here. Well, we're arriving at our destination. Yes. It's called Bighorn, and there's a Y here for turning the trains around. For years, uh, we used to refer to this as Rattlesnake Point. Oh. <laughs> uh, you can imagine why. There was a rattlesnake pointing at you. There were a lot of rattlesnakes pointing at us up here, and unfortunately, uh, somebody got bit by one, uh, but I think they've all moved on. Uh, you think so. You'll find out if you step on one and he's smiling at you. Yeah, I, they're probably just hiding in their holes right now. Yes, with hello this, there. With this many people around, they're just, they're just somewhere else. But yes. rest assured, they're still here. Well, almost everybody got off up here so that we could do photo run-bys. Oh, yes. And we spent a little bit of time. They had to turn the train around, and that meant switching, and, and that gave us a chance to get some fun video. Anyway, the train returned to Antonito. And, uh, there were several other trains scheduled to be pulled by these two locomotives, one of which was a freight train. Oh, cool. So there weren't very many people riding this, and this one also traversed the entire railroad all the way over to Chama. Wow, it looks like stepping back in time. It's perfect. I yes. mean, there it is. There a, it is. A narrow gauge freight train just coming up on Tanglefoot Curve. With a caboose, no less. A beautiful short caboose.
Now, we mentioned last week that the only way you can get wood into a wood-burning locomotive is to just hand it up there and have them stack it up. And this is what that process actually looks like in practice. Yes, and I've actually done that, just not in a locomotive. It yeah. was a wood pile for a wood stove. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And in this case, they had a lot of people helping, and they set up a, a log brigade. A log brigade. <laughs> <laughs> and you just keep handing it down from the gondola across the chain and over to the Glenbrook and up to the firemen on the Glenbrook, and then they stack the wood up. So... Uh, it's quite a process, even when people don't get in your way. Whoa! <laughs> they must have said something to him because he turned around and looked. Yep. Well, here we are arriving at Cumbres, the top of the railroad. Right. I waited here for this moment for almost four hours. Wow. And and it's just over 10,000 feet. Right. So, uh, but like we said, this is the high point on the entire railroad. I think the low point on the whole railroad is still close to 8,000 feet. Right. But this was the high point because waiting here for that perfect shot, there it is. And look at the clouds, oh, the sky. Yes. It's just... Breathtaking. It doesn't get better than this. No. Well, the far other end of the railroad is Chama. Right. And the railroad, uh, the railroad, the locomotives finally found their way down uh, Cumbres Pass to Chama. And then they uh, they uncoupled the two locomotives and put them into what's left of the roundhouse. Right. Uh, the, these two stalls are original. The rest of the shops here were rebuilt. But there's two original stalls from the roundhouse now with two 1875 locomotives. Right. Just like S stepping back in time. Oh, oh my oh, man. gosh. If it weren't for the construction equipment back there. But, huh? That's just absolutely something to see. There's some other facilities that survive here besides the two stalls of the roundhouse, one of which is the coaling tower here, and right next to it, the sand house. This looks familiar. Doesn't it just? <laughs> and the sand house here, they still use the sand house, mm -hmm. but they don't cook the sand like they used to. They just bring the, the uh, play sand uh, from uh, the place they order it and they store it inside there in bags but they still use the compressed air system to blow the sand up into the tank and then down into the locomotives. 
Now, as we mentioned, uh, we're modeling both of these structures on our 120th scale railroad. Yes. And uh, if you've been following along with the channel, we've done several shows on the construction of that. But we're building a 120th scale railroad, and there's the the uh, Chama Coaling Tower. Right. And the Sand House. <laughs> But we're having an enormous amount of fun. We're scratch building almost everything on the railroad. This is uh, stuff that you've been working on. Yeah, it's just out of scrap pieces of wood and, and computer printed paper. And and uh, a regulator clock. Yeah, that, there again, just I printed it off on the computer, layered, layered it, layered it. <laughs> layered it. And <laughs> you built one for each train station yes. because you got to have a regulator in a train That's station. That's right. And our friend Steve has been helping too. Yes, and, and he's the one that's been giving me inspiration. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, this is something that he built. It's up here on the logging railroad, but he built this fun little thing. And this is a, a current project, not quite finished yet. And uh, there's the coaling tower. Yes. And uh, it's, it's come a little bit farther than you see it here in this picture, but we need to get back on it. As soon as the snow flies, yes. we're going to be back working on the coaling tower. But uh, I needed uh, reference material and we've been all over the internet trying to figure out what goes on inside the sand house, uh, exactly how the coaling tower goes together, trying to find proper plans. And fortunately, Pat Mulfray and the uh, friends of the Cumbers and Toltec right. gave us access to all of it. That is just, <laughs> oh, look at that. Isn't it amazing? And wow. So, uh, we're actually going to do a complete show on these two structures and all of this mechanism and how this whole thing works. That'll be an upcoming show, but it gives us all the research we need to know how to finish our models. Right. So there's a myriad small details here uh, that I've been really wondering about and haven't been able to find any kind of detail on. And now uh, I know exactly how to finish this. Right, there it is. And the sand house. Now the sand house is pretty much already done and Steve kind of guesstimated what the inside would be like and he pretty much nailed it. This is the sand stove. And again, they don't use that anymore, but they've rebuilt it. And this is the sand hopper uh, that blows the sand up. And Steve got that mostly correct. So, uh, score. Yes. Because <laughs> he was just guesstimating. Right. Based on what uh, seemed rational. Well, anyway, that brings us to the end of this week. Oh, wow, what a journey. We have so many more shows that we can do on the gathering of Victorian locomotives. And you definitely want to follow along with all of that, including building the models. So if you're ready for it, zoink! <laughs> right there, the blue button that will make you a subscriber and then you can follow along with all of these other shows. Well, we're not sure how you found this video on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring, and we will see you on Tuesday.